Welcome everyone, it's Derry up, John Foyland Davis here, aka The Strategy Man, and welcome to Strategy Heroes. And this is real business, real strategy. Today we're gonna go deep on coffee, a coffee business like you've never seen it, and one that I'm incredibly proud of and incredibly passionate about. So welcome to Joe O'Hara from Alchemy Ristretto, Alchemy Cafes, and several other companies, which we will talk about in structure later on and why that's so important. Uh, but begin, let's begin, shall we? Like we always begin. Which is why purpose. Let's go back to purpose, because Joe struck me as one of these guys, when I first met him, I knew that this purpose was really deep, and the passion was really deep, in probably a way I haven't seen in a lot of clients along the years. So let's come, come, and, come and talk to Joe. So let's talk why, right? Why in business? So we just go back a couple of steps. Now you're an engineer like me, yes. you were working in a corporate environment mm -hmm. or like me in Halliburton, mm -hmm. um, and you decided to quit and do your own thing. Talk, talk us through that, that process of why you came out of Halliburton and why coffee? Okay, um, why I came out of Halliburton was essentially I wasn't happy. I was working in a city that I didn't really want to be in, that I didn't really enjoy. Uh, working with a group of people, some were expats, some were locals, but no one there was really happy. Mm. It was um, a work environment that didn't promote people, that was stifling, that was not enjoyable. And when you're in a situation like that for several years, not really enjoying what I was doing. I, I remember we had a, a conversation, Joe, and you were like, I knew I wanted to have my own business, but I just didn't know what. Correct. And I think as so many people are in that space, they go, Dad, I just don't know what my passion is, mm -hmm. right? Well, sometimes we have it, sometimes we find it. Um, and Joe found it accidentally, didn't you? So what happened next? I did. Um, well, I quit working at Halliburton when I was offered two jobs in um, countries that required me wearing a torso protection vest to work. That's I a bulletproof <laughs> vest, right? People yes. are. Yeah, and if you're somewhere where the, the locals want you there so little that they're prepared to shoot at you, you shouldn't be there. <laughs> Um, so I quit. And, uh, it's like being an Englishman in <laughs> Wales, that is, just be warned. <laughs> um, so we went on vacation, we went to Guatemala, Belize, Mexico and Cuba. Mm. And that was the first time actually I walked through a live coffee plantation. I saw coffee growing and there was something about it. I've always enjoyed it as a customer. Mm. But this was the first time I saw production of it and I saw the people who were growing it and producing it and just they seemed happy and it, it just struck me and it was something I wanted to be involved in. So you didn't go there to look at the no. beans, did you? You didn't go, you were just on a holiday and happened to experience the coffee. That's correct, source. yes, that's correct. And then where was the moment when you went, I'm actually going to make a business out of this? Um, it was when we came back to the UK after the holiday and talking to my wife and her pointing out how unhappy I'd been at Halliburton and looking for what do, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. We've just quit a job, we're in a rented apartment trying to figure out where we're going to go next. And that's the point where she said, well if you don't give this a try now, you're never going to be happy. And as it's very easy to, to point out at that time, you can always get an office job, you can always go back to an office job, but there are times when you have to say, I want to do this, I want to give this a try. Now, listen to that, now, that's a big part of my messages from the stages, right, is live a life of no regret and build a business of no regrets. <coughs> and in this case, this is the, do you know what, I'm gonna give it a go, I have no idea, I've, I've never built a business before, I don't even know what this coffee thing's all about, mm -hmm. but do you know, if I don't give it a go, then I'm probably gonna regret it. But I can always go back to a job, and I think that's a great mentality to go in. I think a lot of people put so much pressure on this first step into mm -hmm. business. Now that happens to have been a long time ago now. How long ago was that, Joe? Uh, nearly 14 years. And, and we'll see the empire as it's expanded later and on I'm today. I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, since this point, right, mm -hmm. your passion for coffee is just incredible, isn't it? It's, it's, how, how passionate are you about coffee? <laughs> I love coffee. I, I love coffee from the growing of it, to the processing, to the roasting of it, to the, the technology of the water that goes into making it. I, I got bored with the engineering of oil rigs, some of the, the biggest structures people have ever made. And in 14 years, I've never been bored with coffee, not for five minutes. And when I talk, well, you'll see the passion as we go through this, the rest of the interview, but I'm just going to, when I say a passion for coffee, I mean a passion for coffee, right? This, these are the beans, these are raw beans, and they are sourced directly from Guatemala. In fact, you're just back, aren't you? Yes, just back from Guatemala and El Salvador. So it doesn't just buy beans, 
you actually go and source them directly. You yes. Flavor them. You, I don't even know you do with them. You we roast them. Roast them. You, do, you, you go find them at farm level. Now this is. So when I'm talking about passion, right? Bags of it. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking about service and value, what service and value we bring to the world? What I love about Joe is it's full cycle. It's not just about the service and value you bring to the customers. You'll see in the cafe later just the 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 high level of, of service and such a high level of. Um, experience that Joe brings. But this goes all the way back to, through the whole supply chain to how you treat the farmers and how what you. So go back, because you literally source direct, but, and you've got a real passion for that very farming much so. community. Very much so. Um, we source direct, and we have now for the last six years. Uh, we buy directly from the producers, from the farmers. We go and visit them every year. We talk to them via social media and email and Skype in between. In fact, I got an email from one of the producers from Brazil uh, earlier today asking if we can meet up um, a bit later this year before I go back out to Brazil. Um, it's the correct way of doing business. It's the, the correct way is to understand as much as you can about your product and just, just know it inside and out. And the only way for me to know that is to be there where it's grown, where it's processed, and speak to the farmers and the people and the communities that produce it and to, to find out what they want from the product as well as just what we want. Yeah. Too easy to be one-sided. See, this is where the whole of the purpose starts to come together. Now, there's a remarkable opportunity here, massive one, yes. but actually, Joe hasn't sold out, which is quite impressive, actually, because you could have even gone, and I challenged you on this, didn't I, in the first in board Did meetings, you? I was yes. going, look, mate, there's a massive market here. Why are you, why are you going to a niche? Um, and Joe battled on me on this one, because he's like, no, I, I know what I stand for, mm -hmm. I'm standing for the highest of quality and that's it. I'm not going mass market, it's no. not my market. And he stuck to his guns. Now actually when we did the numbers and all of this, actually this is a big market at the really highest yeah. end. And you'll see how that has come full circle and what we're doing with the, the, the kind of the level of clientele you're dealing with today. Yeah. We're gonna come in, you're gonna see that in a little while. So let's, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna move in to the roastery bit. Now this is with the beans that are coming in from Guatemala, he sources them. Now let's go to the roastery and let's talk strategy, and in this case, cash. So from the beans sourced directly from Guatemala to how we're going to roast them, right? Now, you'll see the big roastery behind me, but it wasn't always this way. You see, what happens when you get really passionate about something is you grow, and you grow really fast. You can see in the background over there, there's a small little machine, which looks small, but that's actually quite a monster of a, a roastery. Now, what happened, Joe scaled, when we first got together and we yeah. started to do strategy work, he literally went, he scaled, 100% plus year on yes. year, quadrupled the business within a three year period, right? Which is awesome. But then that's where the problems come. Because passion, if it's done right, means scale, which means high growth, which means we've got to control that growth. Now, then the next question is, well, how do you get from a machine that size to a machine this size? And it's not just any machine, right? This is 1920s German, what's her name? Bertha. Bertha. <laughs> um, and this, Joe came to me and just went, Terry, you know, we need cash for this monster truck of a machine to, in order to get scale. And this is where cash begins. Because the truth is, in order to scale up a passion business, if you don't understand this cash thing, you just couldn't do what you've done today. No. So what, just imagine you didn't understand cash in the way you understood it. What would that mean to your business right now? It would be the end of it. To the end of your business. Would be the end of well, the business. Well, because you couldn't have even one. You couldn't have grown, but two. You no. probably would have been killed somewhere along the way, correct? Yes. There's been many opportunities to fall into a trap along the way. Yes. Fall into a trap. Understand that, okay? Now, when I mean understand your numbers, the, one of the first things I did with Joe was passion and purpose, mm -hmm. clearly. But then we moved into strategy pretty quickly, yeah. and in this case, it was cash, 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 right? Yes. Because of the growth that we were undergoing. Now. We delved under the nuts of P&L, profit and loss, and the balance sheets, and there was work to be done. Now, bear in yes. mind, you were already pretty savvy on this stuff, because mm -hmm. he was he had his numbers, he, he could get to his numbers, but we uncovered a lot, including an accountancy that wasn't really doing its job properly, and we, we pulled up massive holes in the balance sheet. So explain that journey, Joe, and what you learned along that path. I think the main thing for me was that 
the accountants that we were working with were historians. They were looking back at the past and telling me what happened. I know what, what happened, I, I was there. Uh, what I need to know is what's going to happen in the future. And that's the thing that you have to keep your eye on because you need to know when you need money for stock. You need yeah. to know when you need money for expansion. And you need to know far enough in advance that you can secure that money. And that's, that's not easy sometimes, uh, particularly with things like this, where the bank does not understand a 100-year-old coffee roaster. So that's, there's two things going on here. First of all, the accountant being historians. That is a beautiful phrase. I love that, right? That's what we don't want. The accountant needs to be there, understand your business, and help you move forward and grow, right? Not looking in the rearview mirror. That's just ludicrous. And this is what we had here, by the way, and we flipped the accountant out, and we've done so twice, actually. Because yes, yeah. um, we need an accountant that understands you. Now, because of Joe's business and the very nature of it, it's a bit quirky, like yours is, I'm sure. There's no normal business out there, right? Which means if they don't understand you, then they don't understand how you're going to grow. Now, in this case, I'm talking, we looked at your balance sheet, there was hundreds of thousands missing off equipment because they didn't understand equipment, did they? No, they didn't. Um, they didn't understand equipment that didn't do the traditional devaluation to zero over three years. Whereas something like the roaster here is worth more today than when I bought it, it'll be worth more next year. And you have to continually revalue that. You have to continually get market appraisals of what your equipment is worth yeah. so that your balance sheet is correct, which I need to then use to borrow money. So let me understand. Now, in order to borrow money, which we'll come on to in a sec, right, you need to look at your balance sheet. And if there's nothing on your balance sheet, you're going to struggle. Mm -hmm. In this case, I was like, well, where's your coffee equipment, Joe? And it was like, there's this tiny little amount. And I'm like, well, how much are those machines worth? And he was like, a big amount, more yes. than that. What happened? Well, the accountant just took it and, uh, and just basically depreciated it. Yes, right? that's correct. Straight line depreciation. Now, depreciation means if you buy a, a car for £10,000 today, it's going to be worth £7,000 in next year and then £3,000. It's just that. That's, and most accountants just straight line it. Uh, but that's not the truth. The truth is, is what's it really worth today? Because we need an accurate balance sheet to raise money. And when we looked at this properly, uh, I'm talking hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands, yeah. Right now, so we got that back on the balance sheet, which guess what? LA allowed him to raise money in a different way. Um, so if you don't understand this, and the accountant doesn't understand this, it's really putting people in, in, uh, in situations they don't really need to be. Uh, now, in order to get these, there's massive coffee beans that are right there, right? And these roasters, and the building, and the, the growth of four, five companies. Yes. Uh, there's the thing called cash, and raising capital needed. Yep. Now, but it's not just from one source. <laughs> I'll talk about blended finance a lot. So, talk about some of the ways we've raised cash over the last years, because there's been a few, isn't there? There's been a few <laughs> tricks. There's been a number. We've used everything from the traditional bank for a loan, which is easy when it when they understand what it is, yeah. an asset that they can comprehend. So give us an example of that, like the beans, yeah? The beans. So we go out every year and we buy $100,000 worth of coffee beans, which all have to be paid for once, at one yeah. time, and you need to have the money in the bank to do that. So you can get a stock loan, yeah. and they understand that. So banks, they like assets, right? Banks mm -hmm. like something that's solid. And they also normally like machinery, unless it's flat. <laughs> they didn't like that. So you'd think machinery, let's buy machinery, asset, would have been asset finance. What happened there, Joe? Uh, we were rejected twice by asset finance. We were rejected by the bank. We were rejected by every bank that we went to um, because they didn't understand that it was a 100-year-old piece of equipment that was still valuable and was an appreciating asset and that could still do a job that other pieces of equipment couldn't do. Yeah. And that it was in Germany and that it was in bits, and that it needed to be restored and brought over and assembled and brought back to life. So, problem, right? However, one of the traits I love about Joe, and one of the traits I love about entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. is tenacity. <laughs> yes. Right? I, if the right business for the right purpose, we can get the money, right? But we have to hustle, we have to be tenacious, and we have to look wide and be creative in financing, right? In this case, we were pretty creative. Explain what you did here, because this was pretty cool. Um, yeah, no, no one's gonna give you the money. You have to go get it. Yeah. So what we did is we had three different types of finance for this roaster, all overlapping, 
because in the end we found a bank that would lend us 70% of the money once the asset was in the country, but it wasn't in the country. So we had to find a way of paying for it. So we found angel investors who understood the entrepreneurial spirit of it and they understood the type of thing we were buying. And they were prepared to fund the initial purchase of it. Yeah. We then had a 30% gap, which we ended up with an overdraft from yeah. the bank. Um, and then we ended up with a 70% finance. But we actually ended up at a point where the bank said they wouldn't lend us the money because we had an overdraft and we had to try and explain that the overdraft was because they hadn't given us the money yet. And it took a lot of discussions and a lot of backwards and forwards to finally get it. But we got it. And that's the thing. Now, now Joe could have given up like so many people would have given up or, oh, we can't get the money from the banks. Oh, everyone said no, but we didn't. We said, we're going to nail this down. If not, we'd still be running off that roaster and you'd be maxed. That was be it. it. We could not grow the business anymore. But we're now, it's time to grow again because we have this massive machine. We've got capacity and now it's time to scale. Yes. But only because Joe understood cash. You understood the different blends of cash and there's so many blends to cash. And actually Joe's used many more in different parts of the businesses, which we'll talk to. Yes. And with that cash, by the way, yeah, we can get cool stuff like this, but also we can get talent. And that's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to move from the roastery now. And by the way, these are the uh, amazing beans. You saw the green beans earlier. And then that's them just freshly roasted. Straight off. Oh my God, it's to die for. <laughs> um, and we're going to go now straight into the, the, what do you call it? Cupping booth? That cupping sounds lab. rude to me. That's cupping, cupping sound like rude. Cupping lab. Yep. Gonna, there's going to be some shenanigans in the cupping lab. <laughs> we'll see you in there. <laughs> so we've taken from the beans in Guatemala into the roastery, and now we're into cupping. Now, this is clear, this is not a sexual activity. This is this, is this stuff, right? So there's the, the green beans to the roasted beans to the cupping, which is water added to the kind of to powdery the stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna have a little taste at the end. So, as we're going on this journey, and as we're scaling up, right, we talked about cash, but the real next part, why do we need the cash? Well, in this case, you can start to see machinery, right? And there's some real cash things needed. A lot of businesses out there, you're not gonna have the same asset requirement. However, you do have an asset requirement, and that's called people, talent, as I like to call it. Um, and as part of this scale with Joe, uh, talent's been one of the primary um, driving forces, and primary issues as well. Very much so. so let's go back. So first of all, the recruitment of the people. When we first had this conversation, um, what's the primary thing you recruit on? Passion. If you hadn't guessed. <laughs> no, Why is that important? Let's, let's, um, let's talk that one through. The first couple of years of our roastery were held back by the roaster that we had who had effectively lost his passion for the coffee. So he didn't really care the quality of the product that he was putting out, the quality was lower than it should have been, and we just didn't get the sales that we needed because it wasn't good enough. Yeah. And we needed to replace him with somebody who had pride in what he did and had a passion to do the best job that he could. And when we're talking about, you see, you know, the passion we have for coffee right in this business is incredible. Uh, and we start that, so in bar none, and we've had so many conversations about recruitment over the years, haven't we? Uh, but bar none, it's like, uh, they have to geek out over coffee, yes. bar none, right? Um, but, there's a big but here. I think, in the early days, what I've seen shift is, there's the, we must love coffee, great. But we don't want is you don't want a bunch of people who all love coffee, but they're all exactly the same people, right? So we've, we moved into psychometric testing quite early towards yes. the year. And we've used a number of different psychometric tests to go, okay, we need people that love coffee and, and share a passion, but who are very, very different in that sharing of passion. So explain the, the kind of different roles that you have explored. Um, so for the guys who are in the roastery, as opposed to the guys who are in the cafe, they need a completely different personality. They need to be not so much customer focused in the roastery in terms of front of house, serving someone face to face, they have to be able to think of a customer that they're not going to see, a customer who's going to buy that coffee in a week's time, and they need to have in themselves this, this passion to make sure that the product that goes to that customer is the best it can be. 
and to make those tiny incremental adjustments that are needed to make that product better all the time. Notice detail, process, mm. process, process, detail, detail. Very different thing to someone in customer service. Very much so. Most of the guys in the roastery are not your customer service types. Um, and they're quite aware of that. But they do have a passion. This is the thing, so. you see. Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of people misunderstand this passion piece of, oh yeah, but they're, they're a, a bean counter, they're an accountant, they're the numbers, they're this, they don't need to have a passion. Yes, they do. They absolutely, they must love what they do. And I think a lot of people just haven't found people in those roles that do love what they do. The, the trick is, it's looking harder, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's looking harder and knowing what to look for yeah. and asking the right questions. Um, and that's where, as you said, the psychometric testing comes in very, very handy. It helps us build a team that is balanced and has all the right people in the right places. Yeah. So, we're talking talent, hiring or passion. And obviously, Joe's also got a very rigorous recruitment process in place, right? Um, which is critical in this, in this whole path. Now, however, let's just be brutally honest here. Uh, some of the biggest stresses over the last few years, Cash related, yeah. number one. Talent related, number one. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's talk, because it's not bloody easy, is it? It's not easy finding the right talent, no. and it's not easy keeping the right talent. No. So let's talk about some of the challenges along the way and how that hinders you as a business. Well, you have to understand the people that you're hiring. You have to understand what they want out of the business. And you have to understand that people have lives outside of your business, and that they're going to go off and explore those lives. And these people are going to leave your business at some point, and you have to be ready for that. And you don't hold a grudge, you just accept that that's what's going to happen. But you have to plan for it, yeah. because otherwise it catches you unawares, yeah. and now you're doing your job and their job while you try and find the right person to take over. Now, did you hear that? <laughs> so, uh, we have people working with us and for us, okay? And those people are going to leave at some point. By the way, it might be they're going out in a, in a coffin, sadly, in some cases. It might go on for a bus, it might be they just want to go on to do something new. Um, now, in your industry, Joe, uh, the, the turnover in cafes is horrendous, isn't it? What's the average turnover in cafes? Probably one person every six months. Or, that, or a six-month life cycle for an employee as a barista. Six months. Brutal, right? Now, we'll do some maths in a sec. But how long do you keep people for? Roughly about two years. Now, what's the thing? Now, six months industry average, two years, Joe. Now, why can you keep people for a lot longer than all the others? They're the right people for us. Right. So, through our recruitment process, we get people who want to work for us, that are aligned with what we want to do, and are happy there. And even then, there's a risk of them leaving at some point to go on and explore new things. Yes. Now, as a result of this, right, if we have the right people in the right roles, and they're going to leave, and we're constantly planning, succession planning, right, and we're constantly planning that people, what would happen if that person left, what would happen, how do we groom that person, how do we keep this person, which is what we're constantly doing, isn't it? So in your industry, so what, you should look at talent, what, every year or something? Constantly. We, we are always on the lookout for talent. Um, and if we find someone and we're not quite sure where they fit in now, we keep in touch with them or we find somewhere to put them, to hold on to them, because we know we're going to need them. Now, understand this, in this industry, and Joe being pretty good at attracting amazing talent, he's constantly working on talent constantly recruiting and, and he's even got a, a, a four times better retention rate in the industry than anyone else does mm -hmm. and this is where people I think are getting it so wrong because if you're not now by the way he's doing that and there's still things happen along the way when you get sucked back in because then you lo you lost a key person not so long ago yes. you got sucked back into the business again didn't you yes so what happens then when, when you lose a key person what happens you get sucked back into the business well, then what happens well your business slows down yeah. while you're not making the strategic decisions because you've become operational now. You're, for me, it was a salesperson. I end up taking all the sales calls. I end up not doing what I need to be doing, which at that point is recruiting yeah. and getting somebody back in again. Yeah, and that's this, this, this talent piece. Please understand, talent never goes away. Talent's the only strategy that's going to free you. And even when you get it right, when you've got the right people around you with the right passion, in the right roles in this case, it's still an evolution. Yes. It never stops, it never goes away. We've just got to be ready for that. If it comes to the time when we think, oh, it's done, just built the team, done. You're delusional, right? It's never done. And we've got to be active and consciously moving towards that all the time. Definitely. So, 
talent's going to be key. We're going to move it into the cafe next and, and look at the cafe. But we're going to do this cupping thing. So, so what happens with this cupping thing then? So it's a very sure. systematic way of tasting coffee. So the same amount of coffee in the same amount of water at the same temperature for the same time, every time. We then take a little bit on our spoon. A bit like wine tasting, you aerate the coffee, you taste it. I'm a gingerbread latte boy, you know, this is going to kill me. Make it strong. Okay. Wow. Now, let's move into the cafe and get the real stuff. Woohoo! to the cafe. So we've finally been through the whole journey with Joe on the coffee tour. Now we're here into Alchemy, which is the, the destination cafe of choice in London. And we really mean this. We'll, we'll get the link below so you can check this out. But here we are actually tasting the blend. You can see he's, he's hardcore. I got the milky bush. But what I love about Joe here is I'm a latte boy. They don't even serve that here because they're so purist in their coffee. And he didn't even actually, he didn't serve sugar in there recently, did he? Correct. <laughs> tell me that sugar thing. Why didn't you serve sugar? Um, we didn't serve sugar because we thought it was the correct way to have the coffee, which was as it comes to taste the, the natural flavours of the coffee unadulterated. Imagine that. Like, sorry, you're not having coffee here. <laughs> sorry, you're not having sugar here. Um, but you changed for a reason. You just said, you know what, we actually have to listen to the customers. Sometimes. Yes, um, we decided that it was the, the wrong thing to have done because it was too prescriptive and it was too preachy and it wasn't respecting our customers. We should invite them on the journey with us, but we shouldn't force them to come along or force the way that they come along. And I think that's a great philosophy, really, because sometimes our passion can go a bit wild and we become, I love the word, because you said I'm not, we didn't want to get too preachy, right? Because, yes, we have our passions, and yet, you know, I'm like strategy on the pages, I geek out of it. However, I allow my clients, or I allow people to, to come on their journey themselves and join us if they choose to. Um, so we have to be careful with this passion thing, it doesn't go too well. Now, as a result of all this, you've seen the, what's behind this, and, and you'll get some shots of the inside in a little while, but this really is, you should be very proud of what you've built here. I've, I've been by your side whilst you've been building it. Um, but as a result of this, there's been some pretty epic clients come along, um, like Facebook. Like you go, you serve backstage at Glastonbury, right? These guys sell, serve all the main artists in Glastonbury. Um, and Michelin star restaurants. So now what comes first? Those amazing clients or the fact that you're doing an amazing job with passion? Let's ask, shall we? So give us a couple of examples of how a couple of those things, give me the Facebook one um, and the Live Aid, you did Live Aid as well. Did. Tell me how you got those clients. Okay. I think it's important you understand what comes first here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Facebook, we opened up a concession inside their London headquarters. They did a taste test, so they went out and got copies from 10, 20 different cafes, and they narrowed it down to a short list. We were one of those ones on the short list. And I remember going to a meeting with them in their offices and talking to one of their very, very senior engineers. And through the meeting, he was going, so where is your cafe? And we explained it to him. And he literally got up in the middle of the meeting and said, I'll be back in half an hour, and jumped in a cab and came to the cafe to try the coffee mid-meeting. Wow. We got the job, so it was worth it. But you see that, the reason they got the job was one, they had the passion in the first place, and two, the cafe was ready at all times. Now, if you'd have come in here and the right people went behind the counter and they hadn't served in the right way, uh, the, the experience wasn't right, they would not have got that job. Yeah. And by the way, the boss man was still stuck in a room back in Facebook waiting for the people to come. So you've got to be ready at all times, don't you? Because you yes. never know when those amazing clients, I think a lot of people think getting amazing clients is quite strategic. Well, it is. It's called doing an amazing 
television job all the time. Uh, talk to us about Live Aid. I love the Live Aid story. How you got that? Um, we were working on an event on the same site that Live Aid was going to be on, and there was a guy sitting at the end of the bar, quite scruffy dressed, torn jeans, just an old sweatshirt, and he just sat on the end of the bar and he didn't say anything for two hours. And then at the end of it, he just looked at me and went, Every time your customers leave the front of the bar, I just watch you clean everything from top to toe, whether it's clean or not, you just clean it all over again. And I said, well, yeah, I've, I've got to look good at all times in case someone comes up. And no one likes to see a lazy bartender. They like to see you working. And that's when he pulled out his business card and said, well, I'm managing all of backstage for Live 8. Would you like to come and make coffees for all the musicians and all the artists and all the presenters? Which was great. So he got the Live Aid gig because you were meticulous in cleaning the coffee machine, meticulous in the detail, doing what's important to do at all times. And that's how it works. It's this passion thing. A lot of people preach passion, right? They're all about, um, you know, you must love, love what you do. They don't tell you why. One, life's too short. You spend 100,000 hours in work. I would suggest we do something we love to do. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd still be in Halliburton and miserable, right? <laughs> um, two, it matters. If we love what we do, if we truly love what we do day in, day out, and we display it day in, day out, guess what? The customers come, the great customers come, and the iconic customers. This is actually now, we're, we're filming here, but we're not the first people to film here, sadly, because Joe was with BBC last week, and it was the Audi advert. Was here. Advert here, so yeah. this has just become a real destination place, and that's because of the passion in its heart. Now, before we close out this interview, I just wanted to go quickly over into structure. All right? Now, um, when we first came along to Joe, something I preach a lot is strategy on a page, and there's multiple pages. All right? And in most businesses, this is the thing that really hampers people and stalls their growth. Now, when I first was working with Joe, Joe had one business, right? And he was yes. operating out of one business entity and one business thinking. Yes. Uh, and we quickly split that. Yes. And now we've got at least four. We have four separate businesses, yes. Um, and now there's a group one coming above it. Now, just to understand, tell us, Joe, well, how that helped. Yeah. Multiple, like, why the structure of multiple pages, as we call them, in business? How did that help your thinking and help you grow? Uh, it helps. It helps thinking and it helps growth because it allows me to focus exclusively on one at a time by looking just purely at problems that affect that business. It helps me to focus on raising capital for one business, but I can also use the other businesses to cross-promote and I can use them if I need funding for one, maybe I can get it from the other or I can use the reputation of the other one to bolster a newer one. Um, so it allows me to separate and bring together at my choosing whenever I want. And see, this is the thing, is that you've seen the, the businesses from the beginning to the end now, right? When we are in and sourcing the beans and doing that whole thing, it's a very different thing to the roastery business, yes. which is a completely different thing to the cafe business. And actually, there's a whole business we didn't even get to see, which is they bring this stuff into exhibition spaces all over the country, um, which is a big part of the, yes, the very much. fourth business. So, and they're completely different strategies. Now, as soon as we were able to compartmentalize those strategically, it enabled us to score, it enabled us to raise the in the right places at the right time and enable us to grow the business and a business to be So there we have it. Um, I hope you enjoyed our journey with Joe. It's been, a, it's been an epic. What we're going to do is come back and join us over in the Business Growth Club. There you're going to have some outtakes because actually we're going to continue the conversation. We've had um, several conversations off camera because we couldn't help ourselves. We're trying to keep it nice and pithy here so you can actually you can get, get through the whole thing in, in like 40 minutes. Um, so come and join us back in the Business Growth, um, business growth Club. We're going to give you all the strategy on the page stuff's down there, all the outtakes are there, um, and that's where we can serve you more. So, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Honor your passion, my friend, and very, very proud of this strategy here.